Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this uh, beautiful place. But Lord, more than that, we thank you for how beautiful you are. Lord, your mm-hmm. glory shines brightly, Lord. And we just pray now uh, that you would use Pastor Izzy, Lord. Uh, let him be a vessel that you can speak through to encourage us this morning. And Lord, for all the youth, Lord, that are struggling, uh, we just pray that you'd lift them up in your everlasting arms, Lord. Mm-hmm. Lift them up, Lord. And, we, and for families uh, around them, Lord, give them support and give them encouragement. Give them wisdom from above. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 4. We're in the passage of Scripture, what Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. They were a church that was young in the Lord, young in their maturity in their faith. You know, and and some of you might have run into Christians that that are new in their faith. And um, one fellow told me they should lock all those new Christians up until they get a little... A, a, a little uh, tempered, you know, they're a little wild and crazy and all, all excited about Jesus. But, but I think it's great that they're excited. The only problem was in their church, they began to say, I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos or I'm of Peter, you know, I'm Cephas. I'm, and they identified with different, different men of God that God had used in the early church movement. And they were, instead of saying, I'm of Jesus, okay, Paul, so today, we're coming to the part where Paul has, last week he said, guys, we're nothing. It's not us that, that the gospel is about. It's Jesus that the gospel is about. And so we pick up today in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, let, let a man regard us, Paul says, in this manner. Here's how you should regard us. Alfred, this is how you regard us. He says, you regard us as stewards uh, or as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mystery of God. This is, this is how you need to regard us. We're just servants. Servants. Sla- Literally, in, in the Greek, this word is slaves. We're like um, bond slaves on a... You know, think back in the days when they had slavery and the, and the master of the house, the lord of the house, you know, if he said, do this, they, yes, a master in the south, and they had to go do whatever the master said. Paul says, you want to... You guys look up to us like we're some great guys because God's used us. He says, we're just slaves. We're servants. We're servants of the Lord. We're we're nothing special. We're just just working for the master. So if you want to to regard us in any manner, you want to look at us in any light, that's what he means by regarding us in any manner, then just look at us as servants of Christ. We're just his slaves. And if you look at us that way, then you'll have a lot better perspective. You won't be looking. Because do people ever put the ministers up on a pedestal, you know, like, oh, those guys, they're the special ones, you know. They, they must be. They're being used in the ministry. I laugh because I looked up the word ministry. You know what it means? Service. Service. Like a servant serving in service. Not very glamorous. What's your job occupation? I'm a slave. Slave of Jesus, that's what I am. Bond servant, actually. Uh, a willful slave, that's what a bond slave is. A, a, a slave that got into trouble because they owed some money and they had to work it off. They could, they could be indentured for a certain amount of time to work off the debt, so usually by number of years is how they paid back the, the debts that were owed. But if you worked for a master and, and you paid off oil, of, of, did all your time, paid it all off, and you found out, hey, this guy is actually pretty good ever since I've been working for this master, I'm doing better in life. I got a place, I got my act together, I mean, you know, I got a bride now, I got some kids, and you know, some of those guys in, in their slavery years, if they had a good master, they were like, hey, this is, this is working out really good. Uh, you know, we're, uh, I like this master. I don't, I, and they would, they would voluntarily say, can I stay on? But this slavery position would change. Instead of being called a slave or a servant, they would now be called a bond servant. Bond servant meant they chose to continue to serve the master because they found out he was good. They didn't have to out of debt or obligation. And so the, the custom was to take this bond slave to the doorpost of the house 
and the master would drive an awl through his earlobe and pierce the ear and put a large gold ring in it. And that ring said, this person is on my property working, but not because they owe me anything. Why are they working? Because they like the master. They found a good master. So Paul says, you want to look at me in any way? Just look at me as a bond slave. That's, in fact, in the beginning of this, this book, you'll remember, Paul, an apostle, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. He's called to serve the Lord, and he found out when he started serving him, he's a good master, so he said, I'm sticking with him. You know, I'm going to stick with that master. He, he is a great master to serve. Th there's nowhere one better to go to. He's like, I haven't ever done better since I've been serving the Lord. So you want to regard me as anything? He says, just regard me as a servant. I'm just here as a servant of Christ. And he says, and what was the other thing he was? A steward of the mystery of God. Now, what mystery was he a steward of? You read on. It says, in this case, he says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they f be found trustworthy. There's a qualification for a steward. You have to be a trustworthy person because you're, you're, you're in charge with something great, a mystery. A mystery, it says, Paul said that was hidden from, from the early ages that God was going to send his Messiah to redeem man and that he was going to do that not because men earned it or anything, but because God was so good he was going to do it out of his love, his kindness. And so, he says, this is the mystery I've become a steward of. The mystery of the gospel of grace. And if you guys have read Paul's writings, you know he's the big proponent of, of grace. I mean, grace, it's grace everything with Paul. Paul says he was what he was by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. That's all there is to it. He said, by God's grace. And grace means unmerited favor. You didn't earn it. You didn't. You didn't in any way make it happen. It was because of the giver of the gift, you were given the gift. Not because of your greatness. You know, God didn't give us salvation because we're so great. In fact, let's go on and see what Paul says about the things what God has given to us and the attitude we should have. Because the Corinthians, they kind of got stuck up. <laughs> they thought, yeah, good thing God's got me on their team. And good thing I have all this stuff that he, you know, can use. And Paul's going to point out, where'd you get the stuff? Look at this. We read on, he says, look, for me, he said, it, 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 it's a, it, well, for all of stewards, it's required we be trustworthy. But to me, he says, it's really a small thing that I be examined by you or by any human court, he says. In fact, he says, I don't even examine myself. Now, this really threw the uh, Pharisees into a tither in the book of Acts when he said he held not... He held no, no sin was he, he said, I, I have a totally clear conscience before God. And they went, you blaspheme. We've all blown it. You know, they knew the law. I mean, if you try to do the law, has anyone here ever tried to do the Ten Commandments? Have you made it through without breaking any of them? Because you know, they, they broke those down into 613 smaller sub-commandments called Levitical Statutes. Just try to make it through the book of Leviticus and see if you can do without, you know, breaking a few infractions here or there. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm sunk. I don't even get a page or two into it. I'm like, I'm out. There's no way I can say, by my merit, I earn this. And Paul, Paul said before the Pharisees in the book of, of Acts, he said, I have a totally clear conscience before God. And they went, you blaspheme. We all blow it. They, they knew all the rules. And you're a Pharisee of Pharisees. You know the rules. How dare you say that you didn't, you know, you have no, no conscience of anything you've done wrong. But what was he declaring? What, 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 had, what had eased his conscience? Did Paul, did Paul know he had sinned, by the way? Yeah. In fact, he said, I was the chiefest of sinners. He says, you guys think you sin. I'm way better than that. Not better. Better at sin. I, I sin much worse than you. I did many, many more hyenas things. And he says, yet that God would be able to show his grace, his, his, his grace and his mercy, he forgave me. And this is something Paul, I think, has a better grasp than most Christians today. 
even though he sinned a lot, he recognized that the work of Jesus to forgive sin, his sin, was so complete that he could sit back and say, you know what, guys? I have a totally clear conscience now. And they go, how, what, how, how can you say that? And he said, how, how could he say that? Because he recognized the completeness of Christ's work. When Christ hung on the cross, the last three words he said before he yielded up his spirit, he said three words. It is what? Finished. It is finished. The requirement for the payment of sin was that it had to be paid for with a, a spotless, blameless lamb. The blood of a lamb. And so when Jesus, you know, when we sing those songs, I've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. What, why? What does that mean? That means Jesus paid for my sin. He bought me out of sin and, and, and said, I paid for that. It's taken care of. You know, Serena, we just baptized her into Christ. Where is she? She was right back there. There she is. Two weeks ago, we baptized her into Christ. And uh, is that right? Two? Three. Three weeks now. Three weeks she's been walking as a new creature in Christ. All the old stuff, I, I, I talked to her this morning just to remind her, that stuff's all buried. In the waters of baptism, everything in our past gets buried. And that frees us up now. Not to be bond in bonds to the past, not to be stuck you know, like some folks, are, I, they, they go, I want to move forward, but you don't understand, Pastor. I really got hurt back here, and, and I just can't let it go. And I'm like, you need to come to Jesus. You need a Jesus moment. You need to get born again, and you need to get, go to the waters of baptism and bury, bury with Christ your old, your old life. Put it down. That's what that water is, a symbolic grave. We bury you symbolically. And then when we pull you out of the water... It's like the resurrection. We resurrect you to new life, and that life, that's like the new start. Man, this, the, that stuff's gone. No more power. And Paul, this is the thing about Paul. When he's talking, he's saying, guys, I just got something to tell you. In my conscience, it's totally clear before God. Why? Because he recognized how complete Christ's work was. Christ paid for all that stuff. He washed it away. I'm cleansed. Now, is that good for our spiritual understanding to learn that? You know, like, should we teach that to the youth? That when they come to Christ and they say, Lord, forgive me, that he does what? Clean slate. Because we have these men, I hate this, but they're out there. They're on power trips. They like to hold it over people like, you know, well, you're mostly forgiven as long as you come and give some money to our group and you, and you, and you ask me for to just tell, to, I'll go pray special prayers on your behalf and, you know, and you, you'll have to do certain things, you know, according to our sect. And, and they, they somehow say, yes, Jesus did a good work, but it's not complete because we have to kind of help round it out. And you're going to have to get involved with your pocketbook. I mean, they're just using it as an angle to get money. I hate these guys. Every time guys make the gospel about money, I just want to wring their necks. I mean, and I know, I'm a pastor, you know, you, think, you shouldn't talk like that. No, there are certain guys like, they're doing the body of Christ a disfavor. They're making the good thing, the good news of the gospel into something that is tainted with junk. You know, like, it pollutes it. It takes away the purity and the beauty of it. You know, when you see something totally pure and beautiful, and that's what, the, that's what the gospel of grace is. It's this beautiful message that Paul says, I'm a steward of this mystery, that God has sent his son to pay for all our sins, the Lamb of God. Remember John the Baptist? Behold the Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. Guys, do you know that the mystery is that God sent his son to take away our sin? Not to cover it up and leave it in little covered piles. There's easy sin. It's a big mountain of sin. And a, a, a Jesus' blood is all over it. It's covered. He didn't say what is covered by the blood. He said what is washed by the blood. Clean. You've been made clean. Now Paul knew this. Paul, the guy that sinned a lot, knew how good the cleansing was. 
But see, some guys sneak into churches and they go, yeah, that Jesus message is pretty good, but you do know you need to do a little extra. And they, and they like, this is where they introduce the pollution to the pure water. They, they start putting in junk. I, w- I was going to say something bad, but remember, um, doo-doo in the water. <laughs> is that what allowed to say? They pollute it. They take this pure, beautiful message of the gospel and they add junk. And it ruins the gospel. And no wonder people don't want to try it. You want to drink polluted water? Not me. But if we could present the gospel for what it is, that God, this great mystery, came and paid for all our sins and he, his son, the Lamb of God, took away our sins. That's why he came. The Lamb of God who takes away that's the beauty. That's the message that I've had the privilege. If you want to regard me as anything, regard me as a guy who keeps telling you the message that Christ came to take away your sin. Take it away. Remove it. It's gone. Because if I could get you to understand that, how good would it be for your faith? How, how would it help your day when you're having a bad day? Maybe you even sinned that day. Is it good to remember that day when you sinned? that Christ came to take that away? I know for me it is. The Lord has to constantly remind me, I sent my son to take that away. I'm just a work in progress, and I know I still got work to go. I mean, oh, people will tell me, Pastor, you just say that so we'll feel better about ourselves. We know you're really close to God. You never think anything bad. I said, you're not listening to what's going on in here. My wife says, it's a good thing I don't have one of them screen readers, you know, across the forehead. That, 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 you know, like the thoughts went rolling by and you'd see, you idiot, you cut me off in traffic, I'd like to park my car on you, you know, like stuff like that. You, you don't get to see it, thankfully. But one thing about the gospel is, can I hide that from the Lord? No. And, you know, Jesus said they thought they were so good with their actions, but he said, you know, you, you, you say you should not commit adultery or you should not commit murder. But I tell you that if you just look on a woman with lust in your heart, that's like committing adultery. Same thing. Because he was looking at the issue of the heart. If you look at your, your brother and you go, empty-headed, fool. Hebrew, it's raka. Raka. He says, you're guilty enough of hell and damnation because you said, you, you condemned, your, you judged your brother. He said, you're not supposed to do that. Jesus said, if you judge... In Matthew 7, he said, he said, do not judge, first of all. He said, don't do it. But if you do judge, what will happen? In the way that you judge, it will be what? Measured to you. You, you measure another man, you're going to get measured back. You judge, you will get judged back. It's not, I don't recommend judging. I've given it up for Lent, perpetual Lent. It's being raised Catholic. We had to take over some good stuff. See, in, in, in my Catholic upbringing, we had to do 40 days of withdrawing from a certain thing during every year. I, I decided, just for my own spiritual good, I need to do perpetual Lent. Like, just keep going. And, and I'm giving up judging. I'm not here to judge any man. But see, Paul understood that Christ, Christ forgave him so completely that it sunk into him. Like, if Christ forgave me everything, who am I to hold something against my fellow brother. And Jesus even taught a parable about that. You might remember this in the Gospels. He said there was a, a servant that, that owed his master just a, a huge fortune. He could never have paid it back. Millions and millions of dollars. The slave came before the master and cried, you know, there's no way I'm, s- please have mercy on me. And the, and the master said to that slave, well, because you asked for mercy and, you know, you really don't deserve it, but you could never pay me anyway, I forgive you. And he forgave him all the debt. And you know what Jesus said that slave did? Jesus called him a wicked slave because he says that he went out from there after being forgiven this massive, massive fortune that he could never pay back, and he grabs his fellow slave that owes him like 20 bucks and says, pay me now, and threw him into prison and said, you're not getting out till you pay back every last cent. Well, the other slaves heard what the, that wicked slave did and went and told the master. And the master said, bring him back. I forgave you all this, and you wouldn't forgive that, you know, 20 bucks. 
He said, throw him into the, in, in, into the inner prison and basically, you know, throw away the key. The guy is never going to pay me back. Exact what, j judge him the way he judged that man. Well, Jesus said, hear this parable because this is how it's going to be with your father in heaven. If you don't forgive your brother who you see, when God forgave you everything. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.